Hey, we're in our series called uh, Survivor, and this week uh, I need to present some things to the church that have to do with uh, our church moving forward. This week I, we're going to talk about our mission. And you may think, well, how is the mission a survivor? Well, because the mission needs to survive. If the mission isn't in front of us and we don't understand it, then we're going to make bad dis- decisions that may put, put us out of business, if you will. I, I think of some companies that, that have made some bad decisions over time. Anybody know what a Polaroid is? Besides me, yeah, you got to be old, right, to know what a Polaroid is. Polaroid it came out with cameras that you could take the picture and, and it, would, it would print it out for you immediately. And you just have to shake it or wait for it a little bit, right, and then it developed. You could see your picture, right? Well, Polaroid decided that it wasn't going to advance and change in its technology. And with the coming on of phones where you could take your picture and have it right there, guess what people didn't need anymore? Polaroids. Now, I know someone bought it and they're remanufacturing it now, right? But Polaroid, they had a mission. Hey, we want to allow people to take pictures and have them with their family. But they didn't keep up with the times and with the process, with the, with the steps they needed to, to be relevant. Another one I think of, believe it or not, and you guys know this company, it's still around, but Kodak. Do you realize that Kodak was on some of the front lines of developing the technology that is in our phones when we take pictures? Kodak did that. But how many of you, if you're going to go buy a real nice digital camera, what's the brand you're going to buy? Canon. Do you know why? Because Kodak did not want to compete with their film-based cameras so they didn't develop that technology for themselves. So if you want a real high-end, good digital camera, you're going to be looking at somewhere else than Kodak. Now, Kodak's tried to catch up, but they're still behind. Again, they, they did it in the phones, but they were afraid it would mess up with their camera market, so they didn't progress, and they lost out big time in that. I'm going to give you another name of someone that didn't go with the times. Blockbuster. <laughs> Everyone's laughing. Those of us that have any age about it, Right? I, as a kid, loved going to Blockbuster, right? You'd go and all of these, these <laughs> VCR boxes, some of you like, what's a v- VCR box? Google it or come to the clothing exchange. I'm sure there's probably a VCR box that someone's tried to give away to clothing exchange, you can see, and it'll be there. But, but man, they had all these VCR boxes on the wall, right? And you'd check it out and you could go home and watch it. You may have to rewind it first because someone wasn't kind, you know, right? They were <laughs> unkind and they didn't rewind, you know? But, but some of you may remember there were, there were little tapes, right, beta, and then there were the bigger ones, and man, that was awesome, right? But Blockbuster, as digital came in, oh sure, they would have the, the, the discs, but they never got into putting it on the internet for other the people to use. So all those franchisees and all those people, Blockbuster just faded away. They had a good mission, providing entertainment and renting movies, but they failed to adapt and come in with the times, so they actually became irrelevant. I, I, last time I heard, there was still one Blockbuster store in the entire United States still open. Some of you are probably Googling it right now to see if I'm right or not. I said last I heard. That could have been 10 years ago. I'm getting old, right? But I heard there was still one available. How do we... Or how can we make sure that we stay true to our mission and not become outdated and obsolete as a church? That's the ice mulling off the ceiling. We're not being invaded. It's not red dawn. All that snow is starting to slide. It's kind of neat. So yeah, whoever parked next to the building, you may go outside and your car is covered in snow. Or teenagers might have went outside and did it as a prank. You've got your options on that. There's a, there's a saying on my door from Jim Putman. He's got a big church um, out in Oregon that he went out and planted. But it goes like this. It says, winning is making disciples or converts who are discipled onto God's team and taught to take part in Christ's mission. I, I think that's fitting. That's why I have it on my door. It's why I have it in other places to remind myself when the church is winning, when we're doing things right, we should be developing and seeing disciples grow. Now, we get our mission, if you don't know, we get our mission mission from Matthew chapter 28, and that's where we're going to be. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 28, and we're just going to go through and get our mission back on, 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 in our minds, and then I want to talk to you about a few things um, uh, that uh, your leadership team and our vision team has come up with. 
I'm just going to present it, and unless I forget right now, there is a full sheet back at Grand Central that the vision team uh, was, was Brian Smither headed it up. Who else was on the vision team? Stand up if you're on the vision team. You guys put in a lot of time and did a lot of talking and discussing. Give them a round of applause and appreciation. They put a lot of time and thought into these things that we're going to discuss uh, in the next few weeks. But in Matthew 28, remember this, this in Matthew 28 is near Jesus being gathered back into heaven. These are some of his last words, some of his last times with the disciples. So they're important words. And Jesus says this. He says, and Jesus came to them and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, why would Jesus need to tell his disciples? The guys that had walked on earth with him for three years, right? They lived together. They slept together. All the things guys did, hunted, fished. What, well, they fished. We don't know about hunted. But they did all that stuff together for three years. Why would Jesus? They saw his ministry. Why would he have to tell them that all authority is given to me? Well, he had to because Jesus had authority. He didn't have authority, excuse me, until he rose as the risen Lord and Savior. That was part of the discussion, right? Jesus, why don't you just overthrow the leaders of today and establish Israel as the leaders in the world? That's the whole point of the Messiah is to free us and we get our day on top, right? We get to be the top dog. See, they missed the timing of it. So Jesus wanted to assure them, hey, since I went to the Father, since I paid the price for all of mankind's sin, guess what? I've got all authority now. Jesus is the true, the first overcomer. Jesus also tells them that he has all authority, I believe, because what he's about to tell them isn't going to be easy. And if you've ever been sent out on an impossible task, it kind of helps to know that you have authority or you have permission to do that, right? If your boss tells you, hey, you need to go talk to this person and you need to tell them that they're fired. Why do I want to tell them? I don't want to tell them they're fired. You do it. No, I want you to be a leader. You need to learn to do it, right? And you go and you tell them, hey, I, I need to let you know that you're fired, right? You need to pack up your stuff and go. How would you feel if that employee then went to your boss and your boss said, well, I didn't tell them to fire you. That was their decision. I said that someone had to go. How would you feel about that? You'd feel betrayed, right? You wouldn't want to do anything again. Truly authority wasn't behind or they're trying to make it look like authority wasn't behind your decision jesus is, is about to give them a mission to which they need authority and, and the reason the disciples needed to understand that he has authority and that he has overcome and because he overcame he has authority is because this mission is about to blow their minds and honestly lead to their deaths we know looking back it led to their deaths see this mission of sharing the gospel of jesus christ can lead to us being outcast we can be rejected we can be doubted that we're sane. There can be disappointment. We can endure poverty. We can actually go through physical harm for the sake of the gospel. And you can be lonely as you're outcast from your family and your friends for taking stands on things. All but the other side of it, Jesus doesn't want to tell them you have authority and I've overcome because of the negative, but he calls us to something else. He says there's going to be joy, unending joy. He says I have a future for you he says there is security i'm never going to leave you i'm never going to forsake you he says there is hope all the things that we see in our world that leave us to think there's hopelessness jesus says there is hope you can be confident hey because i have overcome the grave you can be confident that one day you're going to overcome the grave and the other thing that jesus wants them to know that he overcame and that he has authority is because he is going to give them a promise a promise of a future home that far out surpasses anything we can think of. All authority to the disciples is going to equal up to empowerment and for comfort for the days to come. Let's go on to verse 19. Go, therefore. Now, whenever you see therefore, the little phrase they taught us in Bible college, whenever you see a therefore, you need to find out what therefore is there for, right? Honey, I love you. Therefore, I picked up my socks. All right? Makes sense. So why is therefore there? Well, because Jesus has all authority, he is about to tell them what that authority is for. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, baptizing all the nations. All authority 
that I have, I'm giving to you for this mission. And this mission is, I want you to go and make disciples. Now, baptizing on it, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is just the first step, and we'll get to that here in a minute. If you wanted to go and you wanted to open up a hamburger stand, could you just go and decide, you know what, I'm going to open up a McDonald's? Everyone knows the McDonald's name. If I open up a McDonald's, have those golden arches, people will flock. There's a process, though, to opening up a McDonald's, isn't there? Because what happens if you open up a, McDo a McDonald's? Or let's say you open up a McDowell's. <laughs> right? Some of you don't know who McDowell is. See, coming to America, you'll know. If you don't have authority from McDonald's, what's going to happen? You're going to get sued. You're going to lose everything that you thought you had, and your business will be shut down. So they have what's called franchises, right? Chick-fil-A is one. Man, I'd love to have a Chick-fil-A. But Chick-fil-A has a winning, winning formula. All of the people that are going to buy into their franchises have to have so much money. They have to have so much money in, in reserve. You have to go work in a Chick-fil-A for a period of time. Why? Because Chick-fil-A has a way of doing things, and it's very successful. And if you're going to own one of their businesses, if you're going to represent them, if you're going to put that big old chicken and, and all that stuff on there, you have to know the process and be ready. See, to have that franchise, to be called McDonald's, to be called Chick-fil-A, whatever it is, you have to have permission and authority from the owner. See, Jesus is about to send out his disciples, and he's telling them, you have my permission to go and make more disciples. Well, the process is what he, he lays out next. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you say the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you've pretty much said it all. Everyone that has sent you, everyone that has the power, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I am sending you in all their authority. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Notice he goes on and he says, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So being baptized isn't the end of it. You then are supposed to teach them. I, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of churches and a lot of organizations that all they want to do is get someone to say the sinner's prayer. Do you guys know in the Bible, it doesn't say there's a sinner's prayer. It says we are to confess Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and we will be saved. It doesn't say you have to say this prayer with these certain lines. There's a lot of people, even churches that believe once you go through the baptism waters, it's done. It washed your sins away, right? Nothing but the straight and narrow for me now on, boys. Come on in. The water's fine, right? That they think that that, oh, that Piggly Wiggly was under the blood too. It's washed away. People think that maybe baptism is the end all. And to be honest with you, the reason we think this is because there's, we think, I think, we talked about it as deacons this morning, that there's something in me that I can atone somehow for my sin. That somehow I've walked with Christ long enough that I can somehow stop sinning, that I can somehow make a change, I can show God I was worry, worthy. Somehow we can make a difference. And I only need a little bit of Jesus, right? I don't need all of Jesus. I just need a little bit. Chris, he needs all of Jesus. He needs a double portion. Lord, give Chris a double portion of Jesus. But, but that's the way we think sometimes. There's, there's not a formula. He says, but you need to teach them. Accepting the Lord as your Savior, making that profession, going through the baptismal water. Guys, that's just the beginning. A church that truly loves you, once you've been baptized, is going to come alongside you and say, hey, now let's talk about what it is to be a Christian. Here at Keith Baptist Church, we do our best to pair people up, even our kids who've been baptized, make sure that they're in Sunday school, make sure their teacher knows, hey, this person was recently baptized. We need to make sure they're learning what it is to walk with God. Adults, we've got a little book. We love to have someone pair up with you and walk through it. So you know what it is to follow Christ. So you're not just wondering, hey, I got baptized and they handed me a Bible and said, read John. How many of you remember that? That was a thing in our church. They gave you a new Bible and said, oh, just start reading the book of John. It'll be okay. But we need to walk with them through this. He says you need to teach them all that I've commanded you. And behold, here it is again. I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, this is where we need to understand a little bit of Jewish culture. This whole idea of teaching and being with you always till the end of the age. Now, there's a difference between a student and a disciple. Okay? A student is someone 
who wants to learn and who is taught so they can gain knowledge and pass a test or gain a recognition, right? If you go down to my office, just because I didn't, I have nowhere else to put it, it literally was in a box in my attic. You'll see my diplomas on the wall, right? If, if you ever go to a doctor's office and see how he's got his diploma on the wall, and then next time you go to a different room and his diploma's on that wall, it's kind of important that the person that's about to either operate on you or work on you, right, that you know that someone said they know what they're talking about, right? I wonder if you read it, if it says given from Mickey Mouse U or something. I, I don't know because there's so many of them, right? But, but mine is sitting there on, on my shelf, no big deal. It's got my little hood with it because I'm a master. You know, even doctors are supposed to call me master. Isn't that kind of neat? Some of you thought doctor was end all. Well, doctors don't carry lightsabers. Masters do. Just remember that. <laughs> so, so I have it there, but that just shows I achieved. It shows I could take a test. It shows I sat through class and handed over money. See, that's a student. A disciple is something different. The Greek word is talmid. See, what a talmid did is they would literally become a disciple, would move in or move into a house that the rabbi had for all of his students. See, the talmid would have to leave his family behind and decide that he was going to learn everything he could from the rabbi. Now, some of the rabbis as they walked the streets and they would have their little followers, literally followers behind him, they would look and they would see someone and they would think, hey, that person one day is going to make a great rabbi. So I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to invite them to become a Talmud of mine. That was more of a rare thing. Usually you saw the rabbi, you said, hey, I want to be like him. I, I want to know what he knows, the circles he's in. I want to be like him. And they would ask to follow that rabbi. But the point of a disciple is you live with, you watch, you learn. But here's the difference. You become to mimic and imitate your teacher. How many of you, through your studies, there was a teacher that you wanted to be like? Right? If, if we're honest, we probably all had, man, that teacher was awesome. I know, he only had two fingers because of all the shop accidents he had. But what he could do with those two fingers, right? Whoever the teacher is, man, we thought, man, they were great. The whole idea of the Talmud is they would not just learn, but they would become a replica, a copy of that rabbi. What's the Bible tells us, tell us, excuse me, about how Jesus feels about us. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. We have a rabbi that doesn't wait for us to come after him. He looks and he sees something special in us and he says, I am seeking after that person. Everyone in here, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you've chosen to follow him, he made the calling to you first. The Bible is clear in Romans that we were dead. He made us alive through his spirit and we responded. God sees something in you that is incredible. He wants you to come follow him and learn what it is to be a little Christ, to be a follower of him, to be a disciple. Notice he says, I will be with you always. If the rabbi doesn't leave, that means the learning never stops. If the rabbi doesn't, meet, doesn't leave, that means that we're never going to be alone. I, I, I've, I've kind of got a couple older vehicles now. I've got one I want my son and I to kind of work on and restore I have worked around a lot of engines. My, my nephew raced sprint cars um, when we were in Kansas. Uh, good friends of ours in the church, they raced uh, modifieds. I helped them with engines a lot. But you know when I helped them with an engine, you know how, how it went? Scott, tighten that, loosen that, put that there, put that. I didn't really understand. And as I'm getting ready to work on engines, boy, I wish that Larry was still alive and I could call him. Not Larry Carter, a different Larry. I, you know, I wish I still, I wish my brother-in-law lived closer so he could take me through the engine and say, hey, here's what you need to do here. He, you need to put these, I, I remember sometimes you have to put those, those screws in in the right order, right? You have to tighten everything down in the right order. You're going to mess it up. Well, what's that? I don't understand. It would be great if I had those guys that I worked with teaching me again as I was going through it. 
Now I'm just going to have to go to YouTube and try and find a video, right? If Jesus doesn't leave us, all of our questions can be answered. If Jesus is always with us, he is always there to guide us. If Jesus doesn't leave us, we always have an identity, we always have protection, and we always will have authority in our mission. When Jesus says, I, lo, I am with you always, it wasn't just I'm looking over your shoulder to make sure you're doing it right. It should be a huge comfort for us as we try and seek to make disciples. The, uh, the vision team came up with several suggestions, many of them we've already done. We've added classrooms for those who have issues coming up and down the stairs. It's not just old people. Don't go there. We've added classrooms. We've changed the church. You know, we, we've changed from pews to chairs. We, we've, we've updated the carpet. We made the stage bigger. There are some things we've already done that the vision team said, hey, we need to do. A good playground for our kids. we got a good playground now for our kids. It's even enclosed, right? We've already taken some of those steps. But one thing that the vision team was specifically asked to look at is our facilities. I already told you some of the changes we've made, but some of it is what are we going to do with our original building that has quite a bit of issues with it. It's, it's not that the building is terrible. That's not it. It's just it was built in a different time, and we are having some, some issues. What do we need for our church moving forward? And it's their suggestion from the vision team that we look at building a, a new building. Now, What's wrong with the buildings we have? We can get into those discussions later. But I, I'm just getting you to think about it. Again, there's a handout back at Grand Central. I'd encourage you to look at it and see what they have to say on it. And we'll talk about the process here in a couple of weeks at our business meeting. But I wanted to talk about it today because I want you to be praying and thinking about it. Well, why do we need a new structure? Isn't it just about making disciples? A new structure, a new payment or whatever, that really doesn't have anything to do with bringing people to Christ. Well, in a way you're right, you're right and in a way you're wrong. I, I want you to understand this. The mission isn't if you build it, they will come. Guys, that is not the mission. This is not Field of Dreams. I have seen churches as they enter into building projects, their churches begin to swell. And, and then once the building's done, all of a sudden people started coming to see this new building, right? And the church hits this growth spurt, and then you wait a year or two, and the church is either smaller or the same size as it was before they started building. And there's a lot of answers to, or reasons why that happens. A lot of times your faith is extended because you are going on faith. A lot of times people, hey, you need to come see our church. You need to see what's going on. Man, we've grown so much. We need to build a building, and people want to come see. Just a fact. But guys, buildings are not what we are called to do. I look through the scriptures. I see nowhere where Jesus gave his life on a cross to take beautiful buildings up in heaven when he returns someday. It's all about people. So if it's all about people, we need to understand this. We build because God is faithful. The mission hasn't failed and they have come, and we want, and we now, excuse me, I misspelled that. We now, not know, uh, no, it is true. We know more will. I don't even remember what I said, right? Let's try that again. We build because God is faithful. The mission hasn't failed. They have come, and we know more will. Back to the top. We build because, do you, do you see how this should be a circular thing? Why do we build? Well, because we were faithful in God's mission. He brought the increase like he said we would. We've been discipling them and training them up. They've stuck around. They just didn't make a statement, go through the baptistry. They've hung on. They've, they've got to Sunday school. They've got into life groups. We'll talk about that stuff here in a little bit. And, and now we have more people. We need to have more space for some of our stuff. So we need to look at our building. That's why we build. We are not looking to build because we think if we do that, all of a sudden our church is going to grow. That, that's not it. That's not it. We build because we believe it is needed for the ministry that God has called us to and where we are. Everything we do had better keep the mission advancing and not just be advancing an idea, a monument, or a saying. Everything we do, guys, should be, are we advancing, making disciples? 
that's something all of us need to be thinking about and praying about the next two weeks. I've given you this definition earlier, but I, I want to dive into it here as we get ready to close. Remember this, a student. A student is one who studies and attends for knowledge and a grade. That's what a student is. A disciple is one who is called to come, leave, follow, learn, change, imitate, lead, and invite others to become disciples. My question to you is, which one are you? Are, are you a student of God? Are you a student of Christ? Or, you can, or can you say you truly are a disciple? Your goal is to learn about God, to imitate His Son, Jesus Christ. I keep throwing around the word disciple, but what does disciple or discipleship, the process, really look like? Let me lay it out for you real quick. And by no means is this an exhaustive list, but this is just a few I came up with. Discipleship looks like attending a Sunday school class. In Sunday school... You get to talk about what's happening during the week. You interact with the, with the passage you've talked about. Hopefully there's practical application. That's what Sunday school is about, discipleship. You guys are helping each other go through life to become more like Christ. Discipleship looks like eating meals together. Eating meals together. Believe it or not, when we eat, our guard usually comes down for some reason. I don't know if a full belly does that or what. I, I don't know. But eating meals together is part of discipleship. Hunt, fish, men's prayer breakfast is discipleship. Getting together. Even dressing up in clothes you bought at Salvation Army and going out and looking different than you normally do <laughs> is a chance to get together like our ladies did, get to know one each other better so we can do life and become more like Christ together. Service projects in our community, volunteering in church and in our community is what discipleship groups, our life groups, are what discipleship looks like. Serving in Awana and our children's ministry definitely is what becoming a disciple is like. Of all the ministries Jesus did, he specifically said, don't you stop keeping the kids from coming to me. They are not a distraction. They are not an issue. In fact, he says, woe to the person that stops them. It would be better for them on judgment day than a mill was hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea than if they keep the little ones from coming to me. That's discipleship. Hospital visits. Taking meals to people who have had to go through procedures. That's what discipleship looks like. You notice in this list that I've given you not one time that I mention coming to church service. Well, pastor, aren't you cutting your nose off to spite your face? Maybe. But there's a saying Andy Stanley uses. Uh, he's one of the ones that pushed life groups or, or whatever you want to call it first. He said, people learn in rows, right? But they do in groups. You can come and listen sitting in a row. But the practical application and truly engaging with it happens in circles. What we do here for an hour a week when we come to corporate worship I'm not saying it's not important. That's not what I'm saying. But if all you're giving God is an hour a week, you're probably more of a student than you are of a disciple. I know that's harsh, and I hate that. But God has saved us to something so much better, and we are to learn what it is to be a follower of Christ. And the only way to do that is to keep walking with Him, to surround ourselves with people who walk with Him and learn to imitate them. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Are you a student or are you a Talmudian? Are you truly a disciple? Winning. Is making disciples or converts who are discipled onto God's team and taught to take part in Christ's mission. Charles Stanley, the great preacher from down there, Atlanta, he had his own little school uh, on preaching, internships, if you will. And one guy noticed that all the, all the preachers that made it through Charles Stanley's little classes came out and they dressed like Charles Stanley. And they preached like Charles Stanley. 
Their mannerisms were like Charles Stanley. They even used illustrations like Charles Stanley. Now, there's nothing wrong with Charles Stanley. And a lot of those men that came out of his school when it was going on led successful ministries, probably still have those ministries today. But those men that decided to study under Charles Stanley, and I'm sure that Charles Stanley was pointing them to Christ the whole time, but they learned from a man they wanted to emulate because they wanted a ministry like his. See, a disciple, a true disciple, wants to know what it is that makes them successful. And they want to imitate and mimic him. Success is measured by how many disciples. Not how big the building, not how full the building. It's measured by how many lives are wanting to mimic and follow Christ. We're looking to build because we're growing to the edge of our facilities. We can only hold about 100 people in the fellowship hall for a meal right now. And that's actually pretty darn full. We were up to 120 or so even after COVID. We got back up into those numbers weekly. We can't get everyone together. If we build a little bit bigger facility and, and all that stuff still needs to be hashed out, some of us old round guys can play with old round basketballs or maybe play volleyball or something. Our Awanas on Wednesday night needs a little bit better place. Our youth need a place to maybe gather and do some, some different things. Well, Scott, how's that furthering the mission of Christ? Because we're gathering people together and we're sharing life together. I, I, I get a call at least once, maybe twice a year. Janet can attest to this. Can we use your gym for this or that? And I hate to tell them, but our gym's not big enough to really shoot full-size baskets because the roof's too small and you definitely can't play volleyball because that roof is not very tall over there. But for us to have the opportunity to use it in the ministries we already have, with the young families and growing families we already have, and to also serve our community, I think that gives us an opportunity to make more disciples of Christ. We're not building a building or thinking about, excuse me, we're not thinking about or discussing a building because we think if we build it, they will come. We are building a building because we believe it is what we're putting before you because we believe it is what is needed to help us keep making disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you for your word. The temptation is to take your word and browbeat and beat people with it. And Father, you know my heart. You know the heart of the uh, vision team. That is not our objective. But Father, you've also given us a mind to make wise decisions. You have blessed this church for many years, ever since its founding in the late 70s, with people who sacrificed much treasure to build the facilities and the things that we have today. The people that are here, Father, they have sacrificed to see the upgrades we've made. And Father, as we think about upgrading, we all need to be in prayer about it. But as nice as buildings are, the buildings don't matter if people are not following you. This morning, we've looked at your word. Jesus paints a clear picture of what it is to be a disciple. He paints a clear picture of what he wanted his disciples to do. Everything that they had watched for three years in Jesus... They were then to go teach and see replicated in other people. Father, we have people in our church, some of them, they've never truly decided that they were going to mimic you. I pray that this morning that you wrestle with them on that. I, I don't know what kind of disciple you want them to be. That's between them and you. But Father, we all can keep learning. Father, maybe there's someone here that that was saved and baptized maybe in another church, maybe in this church, Father, and they don't think that, that, that they're growing the way they should. Father, I pray that you would give those people the strength to come and talk to one of the deacons or elders or myself or Adam, and we'd, we'd love to pair them up with someone. There are people anxious to meet with people weekly or monthly and discuss what it is and, and learn together how to grow more to be like Christ. Father, I am so thankful that you allow me to be a part of Keys Baptist Church. I'm so thankful over these past years. We've seen families grow. We've seen new families come. 
We're seeing adults and kids step up into leadership and learn what it is to be a leader. And Father, that that's, needs to be our focus as a church is not on necessarily on how many people we have here Sunday, not how good our music is, because boy, if we did that, we failed the day. But Father, are we making disciples? We take people to heaven, not buildings. Father, help your church, as we discuss this in this coming week, to be in prayer on our knees, to make it a daily thing, to make sure we're not missing something, and to decide how we're going to be involved in what you're doing here at Keys. Time of invitation, Father, is always yours. But as always, if people are afraid to come forward, help them not to grab the opportunity to grab someone after church. We love to help people live life with you. In your name I pray, amen.